morning, we're talking about the macromolecules, and we're going to start by talking about carbohydrates. I first want to remind you of the chart we drew on the board previously that shows the general categories, the general names for the monomers and the polymers for each of the macromolecules. So starting with the carbohydrates, the monomers are going to be called the monosaccharides, and the polymers are going to be called the polysaccharides. So let's start by talking about the monosaccharides. The first thing I want to do is draw a typical monosaccharide on the board and have you see the visual clues that are going to tell you you are looking at a carbohydrate versus a protein, nucleic acid, or a lipid. I just realized that nucleic acid is spelled wrong. This should obviously be nucleic, not nucleic. So let's look at carbohydrates. I'm going to draw glucose. I'm not going to draw the ring structure initially, I'm just going to draw it in a linear fashion so you can see those little visual clues that will help tell you that this is a carbohydrate. And in order to understand this, you need to remember your functional groups. Remember first time around, you just memorized them. Now we're going to put those into context in helping to understand the macromolecules and to visually recognize them. So here's our carbon chain, six carbons. Here's our first clue that we are looking at a carbohydrate. This functional group, the carbon double bonded to the oxygen, is called a carbonyl group. And carbonyl groups are found in carbohydrates. So if you remember your functional group, this was a carbonyl group. And remember it can occur in the middle of the sugar or it can occur at the end of the sugar the end of the carbon chain or in the middle of the carbon chain. This flip is purposeful, that is the structure. Remember, monosaccharide is going to be the general term for monomers that are carbohydrates. And then now, more specifically, this is glucose, an example of a monosaccharide. We also have a second way to recognize this as being a carbohydrate. And that is that we have multiple hydroxyl groups. Remember, hydroxyl groups are the OH. So multiple hydroxyl groups combined with the carbonyl group are going to tell us that this is a carbohydrate. And this is specifically a monosaccharide. You don't need to memorize that this is glucose, although you should know the chemical formula for glucose. You're going to see it a lot throughout the semester, especially when we talk about cell respiration. But for now, you just need to know that you're going to Visually recognize this as being a carbohydrate two ways. One is that it has a carbonyl group, and one is that it has multiple hydroxyl groups. In solution, this glucose will not be linear as it's drawn on the board. It will actually form a ring. So sugars form rings. And we're only going to usually draw the very abbreviated form of that in class. One, two, three, four, five, six sides. I didn't draw very symmetrically. But each of these corners represents a carbon. Okay, so that would be a six carbon sugar. Let me show you an example of that on the board. Okay, 
Okay, so this would be glucose. As we drew it on the board, of course I have it flipped sideways, it's just easier for me to draw it on the board that way, but either way it's going to be glucose. And then this would be the rings that form when glucose is in solution. So I just drew the abbreviated version with just the carbon showing, but in actuality that sugar would have more than just carbon at those corners. There's glucose and there's fructose. So let's go back and look at some other monosaccharides. So glucose and fructose both have the same chemical formula but different structures, so they would be structural isomers of each other. And you can see they both have the same formula, C6H12O6. Fructose has the carbonyl group here, but also has multiple hydroxyl groups. Both are six carbon sugars. We would call those hexose sugars. Hexose sugars are six carbon sugars. We also have a couple of very relevant pentose sugars. And those are five carbon sugars. Two really good examples of that are ribose and deoxyribose. Ribose is found in RNA, and then deoxyribose is found in DNA. And then finally, this is actually a triose. It's a three carbon sugar. During the breakdown of glucose in cell respiration, we're going to break down glucose into this triose sugar, and it's called glyceraldehyde. So it's important to understand that these sugars can have differing numbers of carbons, but these are all considered monosaccharides. The sugars are kind of unique in that between the monomer and the polymer, we kind of have this intermediate structure. And you've probably heard the term before, disaccharide. In the sugars, we also have disaccharides. And disaccharides are going to be two monosaccharides bonded together. That bond is a covalent bond. So it contains a lot of energy. Remember covalent bonds are the strongest bonds and they also contain potential energy. Energy stored in that bond. We're going to put two monosaccharides together to form a disaccharide. So monosaccharide plus monosaccharide is going to give us the disaccharide. So that's kind of inter intermediate between a monosaccharide and a polysaccharide. We, we typically think of poly as being a long string of that same unit. So those are the monosaccharides. This is the sugar forming a ring. Now this is showing two monosaccharides coming together. Remember the way we link monomers together to form polymers is we remove water. So here we go. Here's a very specific example of this. The hydroxyl group on one sugar and the hydrogen on the other sugar are being removed to form water. And now those two are going to link together to form a disaccharide. The specific name for that covalent bond linking two sugars together is a glycosidic linkage. That glycosidic linkage is the name for a covalent bond between monosaccharides. So the, the covalent bond between those two monosaccharides is called a glycosidic linkage. This particular disaccharide is called sucrose. It's what we refer to as table sugar. There are a few disaccharides you should be familiar with, and you should know which monosaccharides come together to make that disaccharide. So I'm going to put a list of disaccharides on the board. And you should know these disaccharides. So again, di means two, so this is 
two sugars. And we're seeing the first example on the board, on the screen. Glucose plus fructose come together to form sucrose. So sucrose is a disaccharide. This is how plants transport sugars through their tissues. Most plants do not transport sugars as monosaccharides. They transport them as disaccharides. And that's how we're able to harvest sucrose. Some plants in particular transport a lot of sugars. Sugar cane, sugar beets. And then we're able to harvest that sugar and use it to sweeten our food. Okay, the next disaccharide, glucose plus lactose, is going to give us a disaccharide called galactose. So the word lactose is in the lactose to help you remember which sugar pairs with glucose. This is milk sugar. I'm sure you've heard of lactose intolerance. If you're lactose intolerant, it means you don't have the enzymes to properly metabolize, to break down, hydrolyze lactose as an adult. And that's actually a normal condition. Um, genetically, some people have a mutation that allows them, as adults, to properly digest lactose. That's not really necessary as an adult. As an adult, we don't drink milk as our primary source of nutrition. So it's actually the abnormal circumstance to not be lactose intolerant. If you're lactose intolerant, that is normal. You don't need to, to produce a lot of enzyme to break down milk as an adult. You're not using that as your primary food source. So you're actually the normal one. You're lactose intolerant. By the way, a little side story. Enzymes have really cool names because they always tell you what they do. Lact if we wanted to go back the other way and break this galactose back down, and then if we wanted to break lactose and glucose down, we're going to need enzymes to do that. And enzymes tell you what they do. So for example, lactase is the enzyme that breaks down lactose. Sucrase would be the enzyme that breaks down sucrose. So enzymes end in ASE, and they kind of tell you what they do with their name, and you're going to see a lot of examples of this in the, in the coming lectures. Okay, one more disaccharide. Glucose plus glucose is going to form maltose. This is malt sugar. So three examples of disaccharides that you should be familiar with. Two monosaccharides coming together to form that disaccharide. Maltose would be broken back down into glucose plus glucose by an enzyme called maltase. So again, enzymes are necessary to break down macromolecules, and they usually end in ASE, and they tell you what they do. Okay, and then we get to the polysaccharides. A polysaccharide is going to be a chain of monosaccharides. So again, a polymer is a chain of monomers. And this is just using more specific terminology. A polysaccharide is a chain of monosaccharides. We're going to talk about three specific types of polysaccharide, two of which are a form of energy storage, and then one is actually going to be structural. Okay, so these are going to be the polysaccharides we're going to look at. Starch and glycogen which are both storage polysaccharides, energy storage. This is how we're going to store glucose, depending on if you're a plant or an animal. And then cellulose is a very important structural polysaccharide that forms the cell walls of plants. 
So we're going to talk about these three specific polysaccharides. Starch is how plants store carbohydrates, and glycogen is how animals store carbohydrates. So starch, how plants store carbohydrates. I'm just going to write carbs for short. And then glycogen is going to be how animals store carbs. Animals store glycogen, like, <laughs> animals store glycogen, sorry. Animals store glycogen primarily in the liver and a small amount in the skeletal muscles. Okay, so in the liver and small amount in skeletal muscles. If you're an animal, why might you need to store a little bit of energy in your skeletal muscle? To escape predators. So it's, it would be a good idea to have a little bit of energy stored in those skeletal muscles in case you need that sudden burst of energy to escape the situation. Starch, how plants store carbs. We primarily eat starch. When you eat the skeletal muscle of an animal, which is what, of course, meat is, you are getting a little bit of carbohydrate, but you're obviously mostly getting protein when you eat that skeletal muscle. You are getting a little tiny bit of that glycogen that's stored in the skeletal muscle. But we primarily eat starch. This is the number one way that we get our carbohydrates. By the way, carbohydrates are very, very, very important in living systems. This is how living organisms get energy. And I think it's really important for us to talk about that now because when we get to cell respiration, it's this big complicated process, but I want you to understand it really goes back to extracting energy from our food. And the preferred energy source for that is carbohydrates. You need to give your body carbohydrates to fuel cellular respiration. If you don't, it will use fats and protein, but it's going to be at a price. You do need to have a certain amount of carbohydrate in your diet in order to fuel cellular respiration. So I'm going to write the general for formula for cellular respiration on the board because it's important to understand right now when we're talking about carbohydrates, the importance of this reaction in the body and how important carbohydrates are. And you should go ahead and learn this formula because you're going to see it a lot. You're going to see this frequently throughout this course. Okay, so this is glucose, right? C6H12O6. Glucose plus oxygen. We're going to produce carbon dioxide and water. And we're going to generate 36 to 38 ATP for every one glucose that goes into the system, if we have oxygen available. What is ATP? ATP is what we call the energy currency of the cell. Chemical reactions either release energy or require energy. Those that require energy, require energy in the form of ATP. The great thing about this reaction is we break the covalent bonds of our food molecules, primarily glucose, and we release that stored energy from those covalent bonds. And rather than having to eat constantly, all day, every day, kind of like putting gas in, in your car engine, you need a constant supply of gas in your car engine unless you have a hybrid. If you just drive a regular car, you need a constant supply of fuel. You can't just drive for a while without any fuel and then hope you get some later. But what this allows us to do is break the bonds of our food and store that energy that's released as ATP. 
Okay, so the energy released from the covalent bonds in your food is then used to drive chemical reactions in the cell. Again, you don't have to keep constantly eating because we produce ATP. This is how we're going to store the energy released when we break those covalent bonds. The preferred source is carbohydrates. They're very, very important in your diet. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the different types of starch that we eat, why one is considered better than the other, and what it has to do with blood sugar regulation and how it fuels this reaction.